My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. It is said that a good magician never reveals their secrets, and this statement couldn't be more true when it comes to a man from Poland named Wolf Messing. Some say he was all smoke and mirrors, and others say that he was one of the greatest psychic performers that ever existed. So who actually was this man who was said to mesmerize everyone from Joseph Stalin to Marilyn Monroe? Settle in, my spooky friends. You are about to hear the tale of Wolf Messing, the man who saw through time. We don't know a lot about Wolf Messing's early years. Even the details of his birth are considered to be murky at best. Some say he was born in 1874 and others say he was born in 1899. Most stories say that he was born in a small village near Warsaw in Poland. Wolf's mother is believed to have died when the boy was quite young. His father Chaim remarried and had several more children with his new wife. Wolf's family were very devout Jews and they were expected to strictly follow their faith. At the age of six, Wolf was sent to a Jewish elementary school. He quickly showed that he had an excellent memory and was able to recite scriptures at length. This attracted the attention of the local rabbi, who spoke to Wolf's father about sending him to a Jewish seminary to further his studies, in hopes that one day he would decide to train to become a rabbi himself. This thrilled his parents, but Wolf, well, not so much. He didn't envision himself becoming a religious leader, but he did as his father asked. When it was time for Wolf's graduation, he told his family that he would not go to the seminary. This caused a massive fight, but according to legend, something very strange happened right after this argument. Wolf's father told him to go to a local store to buy him a pack of cigarettes. Being the dutiful son, he left their home that night and when he approached the store, a giant man in a white robe suddenly appeared. Wolf later said, and I quote in part, I saw his beard, his face with wide cheekbones, and a pair of extraordinary piercing eyes. The messenger of heaven raised his hands in his wide sleeves towards the sky. So, this messenger then allegedly said to him, my child, God sent me to come to you to foretell your future, and you have to fulfill your duty to God. Wolf said the voice sounded like roaring thunder, and after hearing this, he promptly fainted. When he awoke, he saw that his parents were over him reading a prayer aloud. Taking this as a sign from God, Wolf no longer resisted his parents' wishes, and he became a student at the nearby Jewish seminary. But this would not last. Two years later, Wolf was inside a prayer room when a homeless man entered. But this was not a normal homeless man. This guy looked just like the man that he saw wearing the white robes. Wolf was shocked, but he didn't pass out this time. It was here that he started to think that the only reason he entered the seminary school was because he was tricked by some random homeless man. This is when he decided to run away, but to do so, he needed some cash first. He stole money from the seminary and then he went back to the prayer room, but he didn't go there to repent. Wolf went there to count his stolen money. Wolf then left the seminary and he jumped on the first train he could find. Now that is the first story. In the second, Wolf left the seminary with his father's permission. But either way, when Wolf boarded the train that was going towards Berlin, he had no ticket. He couldn't afford one, so he hid underneath a seat, praying that the ticket inspector would not see him. But he did, and, as Wolf would later say, this is when he started to pray for help. He grabbed a small piece of newspaper that he saw nearby, and he wished that the ticket inspector would see it as a real ticket. The man took the scrap of paper from Wolf, and then he punched a hole in it, indicating he thought it was a real ticket. According to Wolf, the ticket inspector then said to him, You're an odd duck, you know. Why are you hiding when you have a ticket? He then told the boy that there were still available seats on the train and that they would be arriving in Berlin in about two hours. It was here that Wolf realized that he could manipulate people and alter their behaviors through the power of suggestion. After Wolf got to Berlin, life was no better. 
His childhood was now over. He lived in poverty and did everything he could to earn enough money to eat. He washed dishes, shined shoes, worked as a messenger, but he soon became ill since he was suffering from malnutrition. One day while out doing his messenger job, Wolf collapsed due to hunger. He was brought to the local hospital, and when there, the staff thought he was dead. Since no one could feel a pulse or hear his heart beating, Wolf was sent down to the morgue. But they were wrong. A medical student detected a weak pulse and began treatment, which saved his life. While at the hospital, Wolf met with a man named Dr. Abel, who was a psychiatrist and a neuropathologist. It was this man that helped Wolf realize that he could slip in and out of a canatonic state at will. Dr. Abel allegedly taught Wolf to believe in his supernatural abilities and encouraged him to explore this more. Dr. Abel, along with a psychiatrist named Professor Schmidt, started to train Wolf to separate the voices in his mind to hear individual thoughts from other people's minds. To test Wolf's supposed mind reading powers, he would go into a market in Berlin and he would walk past all the stalls. He would then tune into the thoughts of the customers and the shopkeepers. In another story that Wolf once told, he said that one day he was listening into the thoughts of one of the shopkeepers. He then went up to the man and said, Don't worry, your daughter won't forget to milk the cows and feed the pigs. Although she is still young, she is strong and smart. The shopkeeper was in shock and terrified. He started to yell at Wolf to leave immediately, and this is when Wolf knew that what he heard was true. But this was not the only power that Wolf started to develop. Dr. Abel also allegedly trained Wolf to use mind control to transfer pain from one person to another. For example, Dr. Abel would stab him in the chest or neck with a sharp needle and Wolf would somehow transfer the pain that he should have to another so he would feel nothing himself. So after he mastered this dangerous skill, Dr. Abel introduced Wolf to a manager named Mr. Zellmeister. His plan was for Wolf to have a career in show business by joining the circus. Wolf's act was fairly simple. He would climb into a crystal coffin and he would fall into a trance-like state. With time, Wolf allegedly was able to go into this deep sleep, staying completely still for up to three days. For three days a week, Wolf, he played dead. And this is how he earned his new title of Wonder Boy. This allowed him to earn enough money to start living independently, but also to help out his parents. Wolf started to send money home to his family while telling them all about his newly discovered powers. But the thing is, my spooky friends, these powers are nothing new. The ability to control one's body functions like the beating of one's heart is considered to be common with yogis from India. In 1935, French cardiologist Dr. Therese Barras tested this using a handheld electrocardiograph. After a yogi entered a meditative state, various experts started to look for a pulse or a heartbeat. They couldn't find one, and the electrocardiogram gave no readings. Yet it was very clear that the man was still alive. In a similar test that was done in 1961, three yogis claimed to be able to control a cardiac arrest from within their own bodies, so doctors in New Delhi asked them to prove it. As they were being observed, their pulses, blood pressure, and heart sounds slowed down before it appeared like they stopped. Electrocardiogram showed normal curves. Now these are only just a few of many experiments that have occurred in regard to this. Now concerning Wolf, there is no evidence in his words or writings to show whether or not he practiced any sort of meditation but it was due to this alleged skill set that Wolf started to attract more and more attention. Soon after joining the circus, Wolf started showing off his alleged telepathic abilities to the rest of the circus folk. After that happened, Wolf became the circus's new mind reader. He would read the minds of those in the audience and then carry out small tasks that the audience would supposedly send him telepathically. He would later claim that people's thoughts would appear in his mind like pictures and those around him believed this to be true. To those in the audience, Wolf's powers were not trickery but real magic and psychic abilities. 
Now, according to Wolf himself, his abilities were not magical, but they were based on science. He said, and I quote, It's not mind reading. It's like the reading of muscles. When people think hard about something, brain cells transmit impulses to all the muscles of the body. Their movements, invisible to the eye, I can easily feel. Now, Wolf further claimed that this would work both ways. He could not only read these movements, but also project mental suggestions to alter a person's perception. Soon, Wolf was traveling far and wide with the circus, and people started knowing who he was. According to Wolf, two of these people were some of the biggest minds of his times, Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud. This encounter happened in different times depending on the sources you read. Some say it was 1913, others say it was 1915, and even others claim that this happened in 1927. So with that, my dear listeners, take this story with a grain of salt. This tale starts when the circus was doing shows in Vienna. Allegedly, Albert and Sigmund were in the audience during a show, and afterwards, they were very interested in meeting Wolf. After being introduced and talking for a few minutes, the three decided to set up a little experiment. Sigmund was to think of a task that Wolf had to do. A few seconds later, Wolf picked up a pair of tweezers. He then walked over to Albert and used them to pull out three hairs out of his mustache. After doing this, Sigmund confirmed that Wolf did the exact task that he was thinking of. Through his travels with the circus, Wolf's abilities attracted the interest of many different people. Now, some of these were very famous, like Gandhi and Marilyn Monroe. But it was after Wolf made a prediction that he gained the attention of someone that he really didn't want, Adolf Hitler. When Hitler came into power, Wolf went back to Poland. Now, one day, he was performing in one of Warsaw's theaters when he made a prophecy. He said, and I quote again, If Hitler goes to war against the East, his death awaits him. Now, that prediction made its way back to Hitler, and as you all are likely thinking, Hitler didn't take that news too well. He put a bounty on Wolf's head, and Wolf did the same thing that I would do in that situation. Run. So Wolf decided to head eastward, but when the Nazis seized Warsaw, he was captured by the Gestapo. He was stopped by a street patrol who asked who he was. Wolf, he said he was an artist, but the patrol already knew who he was. The patrol then pounced on him. They started to beat Wolf, and he soon fell unconscious. He woke up in a police station, but it's here where Wolf's powers allegedly saved him again. He mentally ordered the Gestapo to let him out of his cell and lock themselves inside. And when they did, Wolf left and went towards the Soviet border. Concealing himself in a wagon load of hay, Wolf crossed the border with thousands of other refugees who were trying to escape persecution. You see, Wolf was not just leaving because of his prediction, he was also leaving because he was a Polish-born person of Jewish faith that was living in Germany. His relatives were not so lucky. Most of his family were captured and sent to the Warsaw Ghetto before they were put in a concentration camp. The only immediate family member to survive this fate was his niece, Marta. So after Wolf crossed the border, the leader of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, was notified. After all, at this point, Wolf and his abilities were well known around the Soviet Union, and Stalin's interest was quite piqued. He ordered his men to bring Wolf to him using his personal private plane. Stalin was determined to discover if Wolf was actually the man that the legend said he was. After Wolf arrived at the Kremlin, Stalin decided to set up two challenges to test Wolf's abilities. The first one was to go uninvited to Stalin's country house, get past his security, and meet up with Stalin. Now this one was easy for Wolf. He just walked up to the house and told the guards that he was the chief of the secret police, and he walked right up to Stalin. Now the second test, it was a bit harder. Stalin ordered Wolf to go to the state bank and take out 100,000 rubles without any sort of paperwork or a bank account. When the day came, Wolf went into the bank and showed the cashier a blank piece of paper. He then asked for 100,000 rubles and she gave it to him. He put the money in a suitcase and then went back to see Stalin at the Kremlin. 
This psychic bank robbery resulted in Stalin welcoming him to live and work in the Soviet Union. But according to some urban tales, it also resulted in him becoming Stalin's personal magician. Most experts agree that this is just a rumor and that Stalin had no need for a magician. He already knew the opinions of those who were around him and he was notorious for keeping his own thoughts to himself. Therefore, having a psychic around was just not ideal. On top of this, Stalin was also very well known for his paranoia. Even if Stalin was curious about Wolf's powers, experts agree that Stalin's paranoia would prevent him from regularly hanging out with a mind reader. But with that said, it is believed that Wolf had an impact on Stalin and that Stalin may have been afraid of the mind reader. When completing Stalin's test meeting up at his country house, Stalin allegedly asked Wolf if he could predict the future when was Wolf going to die? So Wolf responded, after you, Comrade Stalin. Stalin then said, and I quote, that means you know when I'm going to die? To that, Wolf then responded, very soon. After hearing this, Stalin's eyes allegedly rolled back into his head, his mouth fell open, and his eyes closed before he collapsed onto the floor. Stalin died in March of 1953. Based on clinical history and autopsy findings, it was concluded that Stalin died of a massive stroke that involved his left cerebral hemisphere. But that may not be correct. In recent years, a new narrative has developed that suggested that maybe Stalin's death was not natural. Some believe that one or more of Stalin's close associates gave him a huge dose of warfarin, which is a strong anticoagulant. It was this that allegedly brought on the stroke but many experts believe that this theory is based on a misunderstanding of specific autopsy findings, which were the result of a stroke, not a cause of it. But either way, Wolf was right. He outlived Stalin. Wolf ended up calling Russia his home for the rest of his life. He died two months after his 75th birthday on November 8, 1974. He had just undergone a successful surgery to the arteries that send blood to the lower half of the body, but for unknown reasons, he developed pulmonary edema after surgery. He then went into kidney failure and passed away a short time later. But Wolf's reputation in life has kept him living on as part of pop culture. His life was depicted in a Russian TV miniseries that was called Wolf Messing, Who Saw Through Time, that was released in 2009. He is also a major character in author Steve Englehart's Max August book series, and on top of this, the main character of the video strategy game Command & Conquer Red Alert 2 was based on Wolf. Who would have thought that a mystic from Poland who became the target of Hitler would still live on in a video game? Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. What are your thoughts on Wolf Messing? Was he a fake or a mystic who could see through time? Let us know your thoughts on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram and threads at Horrifying underscore History, or on Twitter at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for our podcast. For when you do, not only do you let more people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, Jamie Gomez, From Porn to Cult Leader. If you'd love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you really should check out our store. You'll find some great items by going to redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. And if you want to get a bunch of amazing perks like ad-free episodes, free merchandise, additional episodes, and much, much more, join our fan club on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash horrifyinghistory to sign up today. Thank you all for listening, and until next time...